My name is Dr. Sarah Diamond, and I am the President Emerita of Oakhead University. Welcome to day two of Data Echo Culture. We have a live transcriber for the session. Please select your language, French or English, by clicking on the options at the top of the video screen. You can also join the conversation on social media using the hashtag Data Echo Culture, and the session is recorded and will be retransmitted. So if you don't want to be on camera, just turn your camera off, but stay with us, please. And uh, you can also uh, ask questions and join the conversation in chat, and we will bring those forward a bit later on. So today's theme is creating value with data. And the theme of our opening event with Ontario's leaders is doing more together, how we can collaborate in all ways in our use of data. OCAD University is one of the very proud organizers of this event in partnership with Synapse and Quartier des Spectacles from Montreal and Audience Agency from the UK and uh, from Europe. Organizations that believe that data is leverage for development, resilience and thriving in the arts and culture sector. We have 1400 participants, artists, researchers, arts organizations, entrepreneurs, and funding agencies. While all of Canada is represented in our choice of speakers, we are especially excited about the powerful collaboration that has emerged between Ontario and Quebec. A very, very special welcome to the Honorable Lisa McLeod, Minister of Heritage, Sport and Culture Industries, and Deputy Minister Hilary Hartley, who you will hear from shortly. I will now share a land acknowledgement. Although we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance <clears throat> of the lands which we all call home. From coast to coast in Canada, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the, <clears throat> the Inuits and Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. In Toronto, where I am currently located, we are in the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, but also in a city that is a major gathering place for Indigenous people from all over Canada, including Métis and Wheat. We acknowledge these peoples and the lands to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Please join me in acknowledging the values, perspectives, languages, and culture that can guide and inspire us the role of Indigenous peoples as guardians and stewards of the lands, and consider how we are in each can in our own way, moving forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So we will begin today with a presentation from the Honourable Lisa McLeod, followed by Deputy Minister Hilary Hartley. We'll then move into the second part of this morning, a panel chaired by my wonderful colleague, Antoine Giano, Chief Executive Officer of the Audience Agency from the UK. So, it is my great pleasure on behalf of Data Echo Culture and OCAD University to introduce the Honourable Lisa McLeod, Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries for the Government of Ontario. The Honourable Lisa McLeod is a Progressive Conservative member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. Elected in a by-election in 2006, she represents the riding of Nepean and currently serves, as we said, as Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. However, she's played other important roles in the Ford government. From 2018 to 2019, she served as Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. And in opposition, Ms. McLeod served in a number of significant roles. She was her party's critic for the Treasury Board issues, Vice Chair for the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, critic for digital government from and party, uh, and party critic for Ottawa Issues and the Anti-Racism Secretariat and finance critic. Minister McLeod's recent strategy paper, Reconnecting Ontarians, Reemerging as a Global Leader, speaks to the importance of building engagement for culture across our province. It recognizes the social and economic role that culture plays in our province with the themes protect, support and recover as we make our way out of the pandemic. Welcome, Minister. Over to you. 
Thank you, Dr. Diamond, and to all of the folks that are here today, 1,400, wow, that's incredible. Uh, it's also really nice to see Hillary. Uh, she's been doing some incredible work for our government, and uh, I know she'll uh, rivet you with some some uh, great uh, great words today. Uh, we have a very committed uh, group of civil servants working for us here at the Ontario uh, government, and um, none more demonstrated than during this pandemic, where they have been working tirelessly uh, to support to the efforts of our government, but also in order to ensure that the people of Ontario have gotten the service that they so desperately require. Um, as you've noticed, I'm the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Uh, I often say that my ministry is responsible for a spectacular double bottom line. On the one hand, we are important important to the societal, societal benefits of, this, of the communities that we represent, whether that is recreation or culture, um, and we are very much part of the cultural fabric of the province of Ontario. Um, at the other side of this, we were actually uh, a $75 billion suite of sectors, if you can believe that. Um, we, that is larger than mining, forestry, and agriculture put together, and it's larger than the GDP of Manitoba. So we really are a powerhouse suite of sectors, and I often say uh, we deal with the biggest brands in the world, like your Toronto Raptors and uh, Air Canada. Um, to We are the ultimate small business sector when you look at the mom-and-pop restaurants across Ontario. We're also the largest volunteer sector uh, responsible for both the prestigious Order of Ontario and the Volunteer Service Awards. But, of course, we have 66 provincial sport organizations with all kinds of co coaches and uh, trainers and, and the like in many of our sports. Um, but we also represent the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which is uh, the largest not-for-profit sector in the province in terms of the support that we provide there. So we are really um, in every single community, and we are doing almost every single thing. Um, so when this pandemic hit, we were hit first, we were hit hardest, and uh, many of the sectors I represent will take the longest to recover. And I say that uh, we have dealt with a triple threat, and that is uh, the obvious health care crisis that came first, the economic crisis that ensued with uh, many of our sectors being absolutely shuttered, and then, of course, the final thing, which is the social crisis, because many of the sectors that I represent um, are require gatherings, uh, whether it's festivals and events or sporting events um, or meetings and convention spaces. And we actually uh, own, in this ministry, the two largest convention centres in the province, Metro Toronto Convention Centre uh, here in Toronto, and obviously in my city, the Shaw Centre in Ottawa. And so um, you know, that that has been pretty difficult. And, and so we're really trying to plan out um, from this pandemic over the next uh, five years with our white paper and then our eventual five-year plan to get those sectors back up and running. Um, however, in, in, in this particular uh, talk today, when you're looking at the data ecoculture um, and you're looking at the cultural sectors that have been able to thrive through this pandemic have been those that have been able to work from home and collaborate around the world um, in many different sectors. And I was pleased, uh, Dr. Diamond and others, uh, just last week uh, we had the opportunity to do a virtual um, trade mission to Los Angeles. And we got to see some of the incredible work that's being done, yes, in film and television, and yes, in music. And I'll talk a little bit about both later. But more so, we're starting to see video gaming, iGaming, digital and interactive media really starting to grow animation, growing uh, during this time because people can collaborate um, in Toronto to Los Angeles, to England. And we're, we're seeing that growth. And that's, I think, an area where there's going to be a real bright spot, and you'll notice in my white paper, we do talk about uh, the opportunities for digital interactive uh, media. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we do have a suite of five cultural tax credits uh, that do support uh, film and television, book publishing, um, and uh, interactive and digital media and, and video gaming. And, and I think that uh, as our government looks forward at iGaming, um, and some of the implications on what sport betting will look like. Um, how does that impact us uh, in this ministry and the sectors that I represent and want to make sure that we continue to support? Um, we've also continued to invest in, in cultural events and activities, despite many of these organizations having to go up to uh, virtual, digital or online, or um, through dri drive-in and drive-through events, uh, despite some of the closures. So we have continued to flow our entire allocation with the Ontario Arts Council. Um, in addition, we uh, we 
increased the budget of the Ontario Arts Council last year by $25 million and an additional $10 million this year. Uh, we continue to flow our, our funds through the Ontario Creates Agency of ours, um, and that's who administers our suite of five cultural uh, tax credits. Um, tax credits went down a little bit this year, uh, particularly because film and television did, uh, did see um, a sharp decrease for quite a period of time during the early days of the pandemic. We have been able to get them up and running successfully over the past number of uh of months, um, but not to the lip to, to the capacity limits we've seen before. However, yesterday I was very excited to join Netflix in announcing that they have decided to, to move their corporate headquarters here to Toronto. And so not only will that create jobs, but I think it will also create more opportunities for film and television content uh, to be created right here in Ontario. But it also speaks to the fact that uh, streaming has increased, I believe, by 40% since the pandemic began. And so it really does uh, speak to uh, what next in, in the big world of, uh, of film and television um, and content creation. Um, so then I'll take you a bit to, uh, to music and where I think there's, there's going to be some great collaboration there. We all know that the live music has, uh, has taken a, a massive hit uh, as a result of the pandemic and we're not able to see um, the concerts that we used to love to enjoy and we're not quite sure when that might happen. But the ministry was able to pivot early in the, in the uh, pandemic to work with a group called Music Together led by uh, music executives um, and we were able to contribute over $150,000 to support them and their $150,000 to a combined $300,000 to allow artists who, um, who have been out of work and were unable to uh, contribute into their own venues um, uh, to do concerts from the comfort and safety of their own home. Uh, we provided them with $1,000. In addition to that $1,000, they were able to provide uh, merchandise um, and, and sell their merchandise and accept donations. So it was able to get a little bit of liquidity out the door. In addition, um, we've done something that the ministry's never done before. We contributed $2 million to the Unison Fund, the Benevolent Fund, to support um, those musicians who have been out of work and who uh, either needed help with their rent um, or their groceries or uh, in order to provide them with some mental health supports through Morneau Chappelle. And so we were quite pleased to do that. But as we build out and we, we bring back uh, music and we continue to collaborate, whether it's online um, or, uh, or through drive-in and drive-through theatres, we really are looking at building out music cities in the next five years. And so we've contributed uh, $500,000 to the Canadian Live Music Association to build out that plan. So when it's safe to do so, every community in Ontario, whether they're the size of, uh, of um, they have a thousand people in their community or uh, like Toronto over a, a 10 million, you're, you're looking at uh, supporting them uh, with, with bringing back that sense of pride of place and music and getting people out working uh, again. And so we're really looking at all of these opportunities. But I think the conversation you're having today with respect to, you know, the, the data echo culture and what the cultural industries will look like post COVID-19, I think we have seen an incredible advancement online. Who would have thought um, two years ago that we would be meeting on Teams and having this conversation with 1,400 people and, uh, and, and the advancements that have been made on, on apps like Clubhouse or Sing and, and things that are being developed right now by that next entrepreneur, the next cultural entrepreneur in the province of Ontario. Um, the, next, uh, the next Margaret Atwood has probably just penned her, her groundbreaking novel during this uh, the pandemic. Um, the next great singer uh, might be found on TikTok and she might be from Brampton. And so I think that uh, as we look at the evolution of technology during this particular period, particularly again in the cultural sectors that I represent, um, there has been significant advancement. And that's why it's important for government um, not only to keep up to those challenges with respect to how we deliver governance, but also the public policy and the funding initiatives and the programs that we put in place in order to support them. And so I'll just conclude by saying the trip that we had to Los Angeles provided me with a great insight of, to the, of the work that we're doing here in Ontario and around the globe with some incredible uh, companies that, and, and, and outstanding entrepreneurs that are there. But we're going to continue to build that out. We're, gonna we're going to be uh, 
building out another uh, trade mission to New York City, and we're excited about that. And then we're going to do a trade mission um, virtually, of course, to India, and make sure we continue to build those uh, supports, business-to-business -business supports on the ground in those locations, um, and making sure that our entrepreneurs and our cultural assets uh, are being out uh, in front. And, and then, and then, just to say, um, as the Minister of Tourism, um, you know, one of the things that we've had to do during this pandemic is really be creative in how uh, we we position Ontario. And we created something called Ontario Live, and we're we're curating on that website virtual experiences, digital experiences from our attractions, our agencies, our cultural institutions, so that people from around the world can get a glimpse of what Ontario has to offer like never before. And uh, that's really important to me. It's also important that if you think about our museums, uh, we invested $2 million just a month ago uh, to all of our museums across Ontario so that they could actually digitize their content. And it's the way of the world, it's the future. And we know that uh, for many of us, uh, getting that cultural experience, getting that tourism experience in the, in the uh, immediate and medium term is, is going to be um, online. So, 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 Dr. Diamond, thank you for this opportunity. I, I do hope uh, I delivered on uh, your expectations, and I certainly do appreciate the opportunity to be here today. What a tremendous honour, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister McLeod. You know, it's... Um, very, very exciting to uh, hear about the recognition of the sort of digital transformation, the digital revolution, and how it's accelerated in great ways for the cultural industries and also, you know, in the future for tourism. And these very bright lights at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, you know, the flexibility and creativity of the sector in collaboration with your ministry, who have also exhibited that kind of flexibility and responsiveness and uh, data from these initiatives will be of critical importance to explore the ways to build and retain these new audiences and keep them with us as we expand the cultural and tourism sectors. So we do have participants from the USA, from New York, as a matter of fact, and from India. So I'm sure they'll be very excited to have heard about the Ontario Initiative. So thank you again for joining us. It's Wonderful, thank you. So it's now my great honor to uh, introduce Hillary Hartley, the Chief Digital uh, and Data Officer, the Deputy uh, Deputy Minister, Ontario Digital Services, from uh, the Treasury Board Secretariat from the Government of Ontario. So at the head of the Ontario Digital Service within the Treasury Board Secretariat, Hillary is responsible for leading the government's digital transformation efforts in the administration of the simpler, faster. Better Services Act to deliver simpler, more accessible services for the people, communities, and businesses of Ontario. Uh, Deputy Minister Hartley joined the provincial government in April 2017 as Deputy Minister responsible for digital government. She's also been the Deputy Minister of Consumer Services, where she led the government's retail service operations, Service Ontario, and greatly improved it, I must say, and programs focused on consumer protection. Previously, she has uh, experience in the U.S. as the Deputy Executive Director of 18F, a digital services agency in the U.S. federal government. Welcome, Deputy Minister. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diamond. It's wonderful to see you again. Thanks for the invitation to be here and to uh, speak with uh, all 1,400 of you. That's fantastic. It's so exciting. Um, and uh, obviously, it's a, it's a pleasure to join Minister McLeod wherever she goes. Uh, definitely a tough act to follow, but uh, always a pleasure to participate with her. Um, I once read that uh, where there is still art, there is still hope. And I think uh, that has been... Um, uh, just a, almost a beacon in the in the sky over this past year. Um, so thank you uh, all for joining us. Thank you to the organizers for reminding us of the enormously valuable contribution contribution that arts and culture have played throughout this pandemic. Um, artists, in the broadest sense of the term, are often the the connective tissue uh, in times of worry and change, uh, providing community optimism truth uh, and joy. And uh, in our increasingly online world, um, that connection 
uh, however we can get it, has become even more important than ever. Um, so I'm really excited to, to be here to talk a little bit about uh, how we think uh, about digital, building digital things, because that is uh, a huge piece of, of this future uh, with regard to culture, and to think about how data science has the power to help our arts and cultural industries thrive. Um, data at its core offers insight, drives discovery, uh, awakens new opportunities, much like art, uh, when we use it for public good. Um, so I, I just want to spend a little bit of time first uh, talking about the work that, that I do get to do uh, inside the Ontario government with the Ontario Digital Service, which has three main uh, foci, if you will, uh, thinking about digital transformation and what that means to become uh, more digital, um, thinking about platforms and data, and thinking about methodologies like Lean that help us be a, an engine of continuous improvement. Um, but it, I, I often tell my colleagues that, you know, in terms of what does it mean to be digital, there's really no magic set of ingredients to becoming digital. Uh, it truly, for me, is about the culture swing that enables us to better respond to people's raised expectations around uh, the services and information that they're, they're trying to get. Um, Fundamentally, digital is about putting people at the center of our delivery, focusing on outcomes, not solutions, using data effectively, uh, and constantly experimenting with new ways of delivering products and services, uh, again, that are always based on meeting those user needs. Um, we, uh, we rally around the phrase that the, the strategy is delivery. And at the ODS, the uh, Ontario Digital Service, we really try to serve as that center of gravity uh, for digital data, lean expertise and support so that we can help other teams experiment and uh, kind of work like we do uh, with internet era approaches, tools and practices. Um, we're, uh, we're shipping things every day. Uh, we're working closely with Service Ontario, with the ministries across the OPS to, to create better digital experiences. Uh, but I really believe that our most valuable deliverable is the culture change that's coming as a result of that work and as a result of those delivery projects. Um, our mission really depends on three things, people, culture, and leadership. Everything we do starts and ends with people. And, um, you know, we're thinking about how we're creating teams. Uh, we're thinking about how we hire, recruit, retain folks. Uh, a huge focus on diversity, inclusion, and belonging for me. Um, diversity is about representation. Inclusion is about engagement. But belonging really, truly is the magic sauce that, uh, that, that gets you to a place where your teams uh, are, are gelling, working together. They want to be there with each other doing that great work. And so uh, that work is, uh, is crucial for us to, uh, to invest in, invest our time and our energy in, um, because it's, it's teams, it's people that drive this culture change. And uh, it can't just happen in a team in the center like the ODS. It really does have to bleed out to the edge of programs, of services, of uh, to the edge of government. Um, so we're thinking about how to really bring uh, the, the the tactics and the practices to teams across the public service, um, which uh, brings me to number two, which is the the culture that we're building together. Um, the, the most radical transformation, I think, that, that we're working on, again, it's not blockchain, it's not AI, it's not digital uh, identity. We're working on all of those things. But the, the biggest change is, is cultural, is behavioral. Um, we are uh, helping show the way uh, by showing, by delivering, and by collaborating with people across, uh, people and teams across the public service. Uh, our core unit of delivery is a small, integrated, empowered team uh, made up of policy advisors, software developers, uh, content and experience designers, uh, data uh, analysts, and, uh, and, uh, and, and um, product managers, uh, really just focused on a, on a problem to solve and, uh, and people to serve. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fundamental re reorientation of how we're trying to organize public service teams. Um, but we also need to point those teams in the same direction. And uh, I think we're going to put a, a slide up just showing you our digital service standard because that digital service standard um, acts as a compass 
for us, for our teams. Um, it's really designed to be a, a living document. Uh, you know, these uh, 13 points weren't the 13 that we started with, uh, but we've we've kind of done continuous improvements uh, on the standard. Uh, we've gotten feedback, um, both from public servants and from uh, from people who are um, trying to trying to understand it, trying to use it. Um, but again, as you can see, user needs leads the list. Um, and we've made a few key updates to the standard to reflect that feedback uh, from the teams who are working to meet it. Um, our original standard had uh, tests with the minister uh, because we were following in the footsteps of some of the other uh, service standards that have been developed uh, in other jurisdictions and, and, and across the globe. And, and you know, putting your product in front of your most important stakeholder is important. But it turned out that was a huge barrier to people actually being able to kind of pass and and uh, and apply the standards. So we removed it and thought about how we could get to that, uh, you know, that, that sort of core need in a different way. Uh, we've also added be a good data steward as a key point uh, to encourage delivery teams to inform users um, how their data will be used, uh, how we plan to be transparent, how we can reuse data where possible, uh, and be mindful of privacy, security, uh, and any cultural concerns. Um, we have uh, a, a data portal that houses thousands of uh, thousands of data sets uh, from the Ontario government at data.ontario.ca. Um, this is our open data catalog, which has been built uh, with our users um, and for them. Uh, you can search data sets, uh, preview data, apply visualization filters, um, for those of you who are a little bit more familiar with these types of things, it is built on CCAN, um, which is an open source product that we've been able to, uh, to, to tailor to our own needs, which has been great. Um, but the, the pandemic has certainly put a, a fine point on just how hungry uh, people are for data, um, how they depend on data to make decisions, um, and why it matters that we make data available and open for all to see. Um, following the data can literally save lives. And, you know, I, I don't just mean um, the, the, the programs, I don't just mean uh, the government leaders using this data, but, you know, making it open has, um, has encouraged people uh, all across the internet, really, uh, to dig in and to fill holes that, uh, that aren't being filled, whether it's by, by government or, or other entities. Um, and they are, they are saving lives. Um, uh, at the ODS, uh, our team has been um, just fantastically uh, responsive and incredibly busy this past year, uh, working with our ministry partners, um, especially the Ministry of Health, to deliver the latest uh, COVID-19 data uh, seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, there are case numbers, hospitalizations, recoveries. Um, it truly that, that data team that is both uh, making sure that the, the data is in the catalog and open to the public, but also uh, packaging it for uh, our dashboards and for our leaders. Uh, They're truly among the unsung heroes of the provincial response to this global pandemic. Um, it's been such a privilege to see their work uh, recognized uh, on Twitter, uh, in the media and academia. Uh, as really the, the best currently available in Canada. Um, publishing our data openly has provided opportunities for uh, experts and for communities outside of government to actively imp improve the public's understanding of COVID-19. Um, and when we build with a, a, an API first mindset, an application programming interface, um, we make it easier to collaborate with others so that people can not just take the data, but truly hook in um, to the, uh, the plumbing, if you will, and create their own visualizations, create their own, uh, uh, own systems, own content. Um, of course, you can visit this content directly uh, at Ontario.ca, and we know that more than a million people have accessed the, the COVID data pages um, on the government website since they were made available. Um, if you haven't had a chance to visit, you can see uh, tailored sector and community charts, uh, detailed dashboards, uh, analysis and models produced and publicly shared by journalists, epidemiologists, community, community advocates, and local businesses. Um, and uh, again, these, these resources have been widely used to inform Ontarians and, and to help 
people in their everyday lives. Um, parents can look up cases at their children's schools. Uh, local officials can gain insights to help make decisions for their communities. Researchers can look for patterns that help them better understand this virus. Um, we've really, truly uh, tried to help data be at the heart of our uh, pandemic response. Um, but the data inventory certainly stretches beyond the health sector and beyond COVID-19 data, uh, including data sets that help us understand each other, our shared history, our values, um, from uh, stats on library visits to census data on our communities or Ontario's public, publicly funded art collection. Um, there are data sets to help us understand where we have been and guide where we want to grow within the culture and recreation sector. Um, and whether it's supporting a mindful and inclusive pandemic response or where to find an efficient to oversee our various traditions, the more we know about people, the better we can serve them. Uh, data that can help reach more audiences and ground cultural endeavors in truth, supporting marketing uh, and planning exercises, um, and, uh, and going beyond the traditional borders. Uh, so understanding how Ontario audiences or Ontario values uh, funding different arts and culture programs uh, could be could be of interest to other jurisdictions and businesses. So uh, certainly more to come uh, as we continue to shift the culture inside government, embrace new ways of working, uh, including making data more freely avail available for public use and sharing. Um, and uh, with the right leadership and the champions uh, like Minister McLeod and, and lots of her peers, uh, we will certainly uh, accelerate. Um, so again, you know, thank you, uh, Dr. Diamond. Thank you to the team. Um, really appreciate the chance to, to be here. Uh, and uh, um, and I think if you, you take anything away uh, from from this and from our work uh, inside the public service, uh, it's that our teams are hopefully having that ripple effect. Uh, we've, we've thrown the, the big rock in the pond. It is rippling out. Uh, we are seeing change. Um, from, from edge to edge uh, inside the government, trying to move our teams at the speed of trust uh, and uh, making that incremental change that will lead to true transformation. Thank you so much, Deputy Minister Hartley. Um, really in inspirational presentation. You know, much to take away from this, including the important role of open data, the kind of data available in the Ontario context, and... Um, the ways that there can be cross correlations between data sets. Um, yesterday we had a session um, that looked at um, uh, ethnographic and other kinds of data and how to think about that in terms of data that agencies and organizations collect themselves. Again, a great model here. And I loved your lean teams of the software, uh, you know, developer, um, the uh, policy analyst, um, the product, is the experience designer, and uh, the data analyst, and the ability to go in and be a SWAT team, I think those models are fantastic for the cultural sector. Um, the idea that people are always first, the user is always first, and that um, the API you know, is a way of sharing out lots and lots to learn from your very densely packed, wonderful presentation. So uh, we'll take it away um, and thank you. And uh, I'm going to now hand the platform to uh, Anne Torgiani, the Chief Executive Officer of the Audience Agency, who will convene the panel doing more together. Um, she is a specialist in audience strategy and research, and of course, um, Audience Agency is the UK national charity for public engagement and participation. She uh, has, over the course of her career, worked with diverse groups from local authorities to national institutions and festivals, and it is a very impressive role of the Tate, the National Theatre, Manchester International Festival. She served as advisor to agencies such as Arts Council England, British Council and the European Commission, and with Ben Walmsley, who we heard from yesterday. She's the co-director of the New Centre for Cultural Value, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and based at the University of Leeds. My brilliant colleague, over to you. Well, thank you, Sarah. I wasn't expecting such a fantastic introduction. Um, it's making me feel all, all the more or less confident. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Actually, I was still musing over um, 
that really, as you say, very uh, rich and uh, incredibly enlightened um, piece there from uh, Hillary. I was just fascinated to hear things from uh, the civil service view um, in, in Canada here. Um, really interesting. I thought that that uh, the exhortation to think about open data, and I really loved the very explicit connection between uh, the importance of data and design thinking. And I love the idea that uh, data is just the enabler of uh, uh, for people, culture and leadership. I, I, I'm, I'm also very excited about that. And I think it sets us up rather brilliantly for the conversation that we're about to have. So welcome to Doing More Together. Uh, the first panel session on day two, uh, and I want to just say I think we are aiming for a whistle-stop tour through the benefits of data sharing and data collaboration that really sets us up for the proceedings of the rest of the day. Um, so, um, I think that I've already been introduced. You know who I am, I'm Anta Rajani, and I also want to introduce to you, have they got their cameras on, uh, my fellow panellists, Eric Lefebvre from the uh, Partenariat du, du, uh, du Quartier des de Spectacles, Zena Fergie, for the Director of Galleries Ontario, and Peter Pavement here in the UK, but sort of being Canadian as well, um, from Surface Impression. Um, in a moment, I'm going to welcome them and ask them to introduce their work and to share some of their wisdom on the subject. But first, I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit about uh, my work uh, at the Audience Agency. Um, largely as some sort of a backdrop, I think, and just to set, share some thoughts with you about that as a, as a way of setting up the, the conversation. So um, I guess that uh, I, I think it's true to say that the Audience Agency has been a pioneer in enabling and sharing data aggregation, um, the, the aggregation of participation data. Uh, we've been working on it for nearly over a, de a decade. Um, we've developed a platform, software and service which now helps around a thousand UK organisations, um, performing arts, visual arts, museums. Um, to share information about their audiences. In fact, what it really is, is a database of all UK households. And we then tap it, we sort of tag in uh, where people have bought a ticket or where they filled in a survey. So we're starting to build up a really fantastic picture of engagement, particularly with subsidised, but not only with subsidised cultural opportunities around the UK. Um, I'm also delighted to say that SynapseC are our first international partner. And I believe, Eric, you had a large hand in making that happen. Um, we have learned a lot about how to do it, um, what you can be done with such big data sets. I have to say, we've also learned an awful lot about how not to do it. And I suspect that was part of the attraction uh, when we first started partnering with our Canadian colleagues, like, well, we don't want to go there. We don't want to make those mistakes. Um, I, but really, with all that experience behind us, I think I sometimes forget that, uh, you know, that uh, just how, well, I forget that, what we have actually done is to make a big step change in terms of how organisations in the UK actually understand their, their their audiences. I think it's mostly when I'm working internationally that I remember, um, you know, just what we have managed to achieve so far. So it's part, very much part of their everyday for UK organisations to know where all our audiences are and really to know where they aren't as well, to know what they like and what they are like, to know who is left out and even perhaps what we need to do about it. And um, more, more importantly than all of that, I think, is the idea that that understanding is really widely shared and known across the whole cultural sector. We just know these things now. I'm not sure that people even necessarily know where they knew them from, if you like. Um, I really, I was thinking a lot about what uh, Hillary was just talking about, that ripple effect, a little bit of data going quite a long way. But also mostly I was thinking that we have made a small contribution towards that culture change where people do feel confident about using data and feel it to be important in their work as creative professionals. Um, the numbers around uh, for the cultural sector, um, the, the, the percentages of people who think that data is a really important part of their work have risen really considerably in the last few years. And I'd like to think that we are a small part of that. In the end, though, data sharing really has been my life's work. It's the thing that I'm really excited about. And I genuinely believe that, um, that data sharing and sharing intelligence more broadly, as well as the actual hard data and the open data, really does is the key to unlocking greater cultural democracy and more creative opportunity for our citizens. Um, but having said that, I now have some marvellous examples of people who are also working in the same space and working towards the same end. So it's really good to know that we're not alone. There is much more to do. And I think I'm now going to turn to Eric first um, and ask you to introduce yourself and your work and to share some of your thinking on the value otherwise of the pains and the gains, I think, of data sharing. 
Merci beaucoup, Anne. Uh, effectivement, Thank you very much, Anne. Indeed, all the work that you've been done in the last uh, decade uh, have hugely inspired us and have inspired, I think, the creation of uh, Synapse C. And that's what I'm going to present to you now. I am uh, the executive director of the Partenariat du Quartier des Spectacles. And to explain our interest in mutualizing information, if you can bear with me for a second. Donc, est-ce que vous voyez mon écran? I will share my slides. Can you see them? We oh, did briefly. It's just giving us a bit of time to breathe, Eric. Don't worry. It's all good. Donc, euh, le partenariat du quartier. So, the Partenariat du Quartier des Spectacles is a non-profit organization that manages the east part of downtown. On one square kilometer, we have 30 showrooms, more than 100 shows a month, eight public spaces, animated public, uh, public spaces. We have over 40 festivals, 5 million festival goers. So, it's about a quarter of all ticket sales in Quebec. So, quite early in 2012, we asked our Ourselves. How can we support that sector? How can we understand them better? So there was a series of actions within a strategic plan that was established. But one thing kept coming back, which was better understanding our public. So starting in 2012, we were starting to try and figure out uh, how to do things. One of the well-known ways of doing things were surveys. But quite early, we wanted to create an event, a hackathon, in uh, 2017, where we can convinced about uh, 20 organizations, the largest cultural institutions of the neighborhood, the site of the festivals, the Place des Arts and theaters, to bring their data together. So 8.0 million transactions were put together in an event that brought about 120 data analysts who worked uh, voluntarily for, during three days to take out all this know-how that the cultural data could bring. We in enrich this with sociodemographic data, uh, survey data, um, census data, and uh, data given by the city. So from that came more than 200 recommendations, graphs, tables, the distance that people traveled uh, according to the different uh, cultural spaces, which ones attracted people from the farthest, the closest, if that had an effect, uh, depending on the time time of the show, whether it was at 6 or 7, if it was a Saturday or a Friday. And the whole concept of competition that was important to see, when are we starting to cannibalize our audience and to try and see if we can have four or five humor shows on the same evening that didn't have an effect. But as soon as there's a second dance show on the same evening, that has an effect. So how we could work together and quickly around that that event, we said we have to make this sustainable over time. We can't do this only once. We have to act to understand the effect on the public, on the con uh, consumption of culture, participation. And that's what brought us to create Synapse C that has the mandate to mutualize and analyze data in a permanent manner, also to tra train the whole cultural sector to learn different techniques that are very present in other sectors like banking or uh, uh, sports, uh, skiing, golfing, but in the cultural sector, it wasn't that present. So the idea is to re-give the cultural sector uh, what uh, we can take out of uh, all this. Now, what are the benefits of mutualization? There's a great benefit for the public. We speak of governance practices that are uh, uniform and ethical. We know that the cultural sector wants to be not only legal, but want to be exemplary in their relationship with the public, as it is hugely important to them. So to mutualize, to have common practices, really builds trust. It also allows us to improve uh, the offering when we know the public, so the public is we winner in that. There's a lot of benefits for the organizations also. An improvement of the knowledge of our public, of the public of our peers, the public of the territory also, and, and also of the non-public, because that's the interest of the mutualization. We all have one piece of the puzzle, but by putting it all together, we see the whole image. 
dashboards also and the sharing of knowledge because what's behind the sharing of data is developing common knowledge. We're not sharing the data, we're sharing the intelligence behind the data. And that's a very important. And, uh, the audience agency does it incredibly well and uh, we learn a lot from them in terms of uh, comparison and developing a segmentation around the audience and enriching the data and this allows a better understanding of course for public partners of the market the disciplines the region to see how the sectors develop uh, and allow us to have a collective vision of the data and also to improve our knowledge and abilities uh, in the whole sector so I think that that's what we've learned in the last uh, years and now we share with uh, all of Quebec and uh, Canada what uh, we have learned. I have to say I'm very, very excited about um, the fact that we are now going to we're going to double our power and be able to learn much together. That's what I'm very much looking forward to, Eric. So thank you really a lot for that. And I think there's a, a common theme in Zenab and Peter's story around the importance of sharing, also about sharing learning and confidence and capacity, but there's more to it than that. So Zenab, are you you you're going to co-present? So over to you, is that right? Are you kicking off for us? Great. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. Um, Lovely. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be part of this exciting program. And, and thanks to everyone who's worked at putting this on and Dr. Sarah Diamond for inviting us. Um, I just want to give a really quick context of Gallery Ontario, Ontario Galleries, GOG in short. We're a 50-year-old association serving the visual arts sector, but more specifically public art galleries. Whilst we're based in Ontario, we do have a national reach. We have 270 members, a network of 2,700 art professionals, and our member galleries attract estimated 3.5 million visitors annually. We do serve a heterogeneous sector with different business models. Today, we're really excited to share the work that we've been doing at GOG. It is our data project, data shy to data driven. Now, we realize and recognize that increasingly, uh, the public art gallery um, sector will see the prevalence of data-driven decision-making, which will have a de decisive impact on its business model. And to kind of understand the current state of the sector, we identified three stages. Um, data shy, which is the inability to engage the digital data ecosystem. The data ready, really to meet funders' expectations and data-driven for galleries to fulfill mission and vision. And what we know is that much of our membership is in the data shy category. And through this project, we intend to significantly transform the organizations towards the data ready stage with its ultimate readiness to be data driven organizations, which really also implies the birth of new business models. Uh, and, and really, as Deputy Minister Hartley says, the biggest transformation is cultural. This project will enable us to be good stewards. Um, so the data is everywhere data is ubiquitous, why should we engage with it? And yet we find often crucial data is left untapped. Next slide. Um, so the state of the field, as I said, is data shy. Um, the funders have their own needs, um, the data ready, and they set the metric expectations and define business success. And important to note, these are not defined by the sector. The transformation as galleries become driven, data driven will see new business models, self-determined success metrics, find new relevance, new connections, new audiences, um, and new knowledge. And um, as we know, data is every day is everywhere. We do recognize that everything also produces data and that every aspect of the gallery's world from collections management through to audience engagement produces data that can produce insight and informed decisions. And there's a real need to build the capacity, the data literacy and understanding um, at all levels of, of um, the gallery sector. And we understand that the sector does not have a data strat strategy. Next. Um, so you can see what the three phases um, are, as we said, from, from data shy to, to data driven. But we've built on a pathway um, on this project, on, initi on, initi on initiatives such as digitization of collections and best skills and practices associated with you know, um, issues of licensing, licensing and copyright, 
catalogs and record managements in the digital age, collections and data for art gallery and museum professionals. Uh, we did host a very large forum in 20, 2018, Ideas Digital Forum, to really uh, encourage the gallery sector to engage with data and digital technologies. And then last year, we launched our digital data mixer to build literacy around data, and then launched into uh, our data shy, data driven program. And I'm going to hand this over to you, Peter, now to go on with the next couple of slides. Great, thank you. So. Uh... The program is cohort based and uh, you can see on the right hand side the current cohort uh, which will be refreshed uh, every year as we go on a, a cycle of uh, learning and discovery with uh, our, our, our art galleries that we're working with. And uh, the curriculum is del delivered through workshops and ongoing mentoring that fits in between the workshop program. And you can see on the left hand side of the screen here some of the topics that we are covering. And one that uh, I'd like to draw your attention to is the ethics uh, line there. And that is a p one particular focal point of the project, so much so that we brought in uh, Narendra Raja from the School of Interactive Art and Technology at Simon Fraser U University, who uh, explores the ethical dimension of data gathering and processing and how that sits with the art gallery, especially in, uh, in, in connection with uh, their community settings. And you can see here some screen grabs from uh, some of the activities that we've been doing. Of course, this has all been pivoted to an entirely digital delivery throughout the pandemic. Uh, and uh, so you can see some of my colleagues here in the mentorship team. And uh, I'd like to particularly uh, point out Erin Canning on the right, who, uh, as well as uh, helping our participants learn some really useful tools in terms of data cleaning and processing, also uh, structured her learning uh, around uh, how data uh, in the collection, in the audience data and everything embodies biases and can be used to try and reduce and eliminate those biases in the structures of the, of the institution. So, for example, systemic racism, sexism, etc. They're all embodied in the practice of the of the gallery and data itself can be used to expose and work with those biases. And back to you, Zainab. Great, thank you. Um, so some of the things that we're really sort of thinking about are, are you know, emerging themes like the metrics. How do we measure new things that haven't been done before? Uh, footfall may no longer be the measure of success. How will data expose racism, colonial power, structural barriers that exist within the institution and the collection? How will data identify possibilities for new correlations between personal and artifact, people and collection, content and institution, and accessibility for viewers and artists? What is the data which is outside the technological ecosystem? How will we share our knowledge and our intelligence? In other words, how will we take collective action? So um, if you could just go to the next slide, uh, just uh, very quickly, I just want to say thank you to our funders and partners, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Anne. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I'm afraid, Zainab, that's absolutely fascinating. And we had a, I'm, I'm afraid I, I may turn that brilliant question that you ended on back on you all. It was so good. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to give you a minute to think about that and just say that we did have a, we had a fantastic prepar preparatory rehearsal conversation about this. And I discovered with some delight uh, that where we had, you, you've got data shy, we, we did a similar sort of piece of research work around a piece of what we called uh, data for data haters. Services for data haters, how could we move people away from being data haters to being perhaps data shy and then moving on? But actually, when we discovered, when we actually asked people if they did take data and how, how they felt about it, we discovered that a very high proportion of people um, uh, believe that data can enrich their, their work as creatives, as people uh, um, involved in participation and uh, enabling 
you know, the, the, the cultural sector. But actually, it was really about the confidence. It was really about people's confidence level. So I think that's absolutely right. So I think this idea of mutualization, I'm, I'm taking some lovely vocabulary away from the Canadian uh, world at the moment, but the, the notion of mutualization definitely helps us to overcome some of those things. But actually, to come back to your question, Zainab, can I ask you, what is your feeling as you move through this project? How are we going to measure new things? I mean, has this project helped you to start to answer some of those really, uh, you know, challenging questions? How do we measure new things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's uh, that's the question we're posing um, to our cohorts, and and we want to uh, really try and go be be beyond the way we've thought about the world. And I think COVID has given us that perfect opportunity to kind of rethink or reimagine, you know, what what is it that is now possible for us? And and instead of the funders determining what the metrics of success, we need to be much more self-determined. Um, you know, I, I think that um, um, we'll, we'll come to that, though, by working together and building a comparative understanding, uh, the, you know, look at... Um, you know what we what we bring to the table together. What is that intelligence, which will help us hopefully decide wh that we can agree on things and that we can move forward in certain ways. Um, and I think there are some blocks to this. Um, basically, it is that we don't have this culture, and I think part of it comes out of a, a policy and legal framework. And I know we're talking about sharing data intelligence and not the actual data sets or the data lists, but I think we need to change that culture as as we as we're driving people to become more data oriented, data driven. We also need to share the culture to say yes, we need to share uh, for us to be able to take this collective action that we we eventually want to agree on and move things forward. Um, Peter and Eric, I'm sure, <laughs> we can add to that. Little. Absolutely. I was going to just become your point there that in a sense, if you um, if you have control of the data, if you like, if you decide what data gets collected, what gets done with it and who you share it with on a very mutual basis, you are, of course, then in control of your own measures of success. And, you you know, that I think that we are, you know, this gives us a certain agency that we didn't have before. I think there was something in that story from uh, 2012, Eric, that you were telling us about, you know, kind of uh, becoming more proactive in able to the data. Would you... What Oui, oui, bien sûr. Uh, mais je reviendrai peut-être un petit peu sur yes. les, les yep. five steps. Les But I like the, the idea of the five steps, the five steps that you proposed in your uh, approach. So what we want to do with data. I find it very interesting to ask ourselves those questions. I think most of the organizations are lacking the proper tools to be able to carry on to the next step. So, of course, there's also so the legal ethic piece that is um, uh, hampering and the people do not know exactly so they want to, um, to, to to work in an exemplary way so we need to give them the tools and besides that that's a competition aspect of organizations competing on the same territory I will learn less I'm less uh, less tool than, than my neighbor he's going to leave with more information so there's a perception that there's a danger of losing something in, as part of that mutualization. So we have to work with those elements, keeping in mind that it's really the intelligence that we want to share around it. So, so far, it was a little bit of, um, of a deterrent um, or an obstacle. And then there's the capacity to apply that information. So how do I bring that information back home? Often there were uh, small organizations, larger organizations, and uh, some said, "Well, we have somebody in charge of marketing and communication," and uh, and and then they feel like they're over overwhelmed by everything that they have to do, and they wonder how to uh, use the maximum of that intelligence, how they would be able to 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 do max the maximum use out of that intelligence. So that's the main question. So that's why it's even more important to mutualize the data. But besides the data, also the competencies, the skills and the tools. 
company. <laughs> and that's definitely in this story, isn't it? This this idea that actually um, uh, the, the the one of the gains there, there, there is both a fear and a gain, as you point out, in the idea of working together. And we had a very interesting conversation about this before about um, all sorts of anxieties about being in the same room and needing to show your vulnerabilities, perhaps not only the vulnerabilities in your um, business, you know, actually the data shows that you are or not doing things as well as you might, and perhaps people feel very exposed there, but also in your own competence, as you said. So so there is something about, it's very difficult uh, to learn in a, from a defensive position. So part of this benefit of mutualization, I think has, is, is to open up, to, for us to be honest about what we don't know and to feel um, encouraged by each other rather than threatened by each other. And so programs like uh, like this one, it feels to me, have, have really done that. And I really Really like uh, yes, I don't, Peter. I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that, or also I believe the the decision making, the data driven decision making tree that we're looking at there is yours. I don't know if you'd like to comment on either of those. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I think um, the, the 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 sort of term that we've been using, shy. It was actually uh, so Zainab's word uh, from the initial kind of concept of this this project, and that has been something that really has been borne out through experience. That people are shy; they're they're not kind of sure whether they can give themselves permission to move forward with with some of this work. But through the kind of working together, through the discovering that uh, the large organisation is in the same situation as the small one and 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 that there's sort of uh, um uh common points that are between everybody as well as many differences through that i think people have built their confidence and i think the other thing that's been really important to this is really just that principle of, of uh, that runs through all digital which is iteration is to keep looping back through those steps and to uh keep refining keep reviewing keep trying new things and we found that's been a really good way to both open up insight, but also for people to work together. They, they, they're much more uh, able to give themselves permission to work together if they if they can see it's in little steps and that they can kind of root back and not committing to anything too big up front. Completely. I guess that uh, that kind of, uh, that, that design thinking idea, the lean working that, um, uh, Hillary brought into the conversation before. I mean, actually, without data, it's very difficult for us to do that. But those are entirely new. You know, that 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 moving away from waterfall ways of working. We need the data if we're going to do that, and we need that confidence to be able to use it in that kind of way, don't we? I guess that that's a a pretty a big principle there. I know the big question that we said we were going to ask, um, and I'm going to ask it as our final question because I think we're a little. This was was going to be a short, uh, wet your appetite session, um, and actually we just got a couple of minutes left, so I just wanted to come back to the question that Eric so brilliantly uh, answered about who really benefits because you opened our eyes up to the idea that actually when we do mutualize, when we work together, when we collaborate, who benefits from it? But I would like to ask all of you in turn, just to give us an idea about where you think the great, you know, who really benefits from collaboration when we get together. Uh, we, we perhaps do as individuals as we talked about, but who, where, where is the benefit of us getting together and sharing our data? and sharing our data practice. Uh, Zainab, would you like to kick us off there? Yeah, um, I think that there are many who are beneficiaries of this work, you know, the funder, the regulator, the organization, the audience, the publics, the many publics. Um, I guess, um, uh, but I think there are two parts of this. And for me, uh, and this is sort of where the ethical component comes in, is who is not there. And I think it's really critical. Who is systematic, systematically kept out of the data? And I think it's a really critical issue. And I think that, um, you know, we, we work on so many assumptions, but I think we need to check those. Because uh, more interestingly, I, I always find it, it's who's being left out is perhaps, you know, uh, something we need to be really uh, very, very aware of. And, and look at how we fix that. Um, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I think that's a brilliant observation. I mean, because to me, that is one of the greatest drivers. It's not until you put all your data together that you can see that you're all super serving a very small number of people, sometimes, not always. Uh, and actually, it's own, you know, it's, it's where we've had intervention, where data-informed interventions have tried to do something else. That suddenly, for the first time, really, at any scale, we've been able to see what radically different behaviours can actually stop leaving people out, as it were, or start welcoming people in, or indeed 
giving people the money so they can go make their own places so they can invite people in. So that's right. I think unless you put the data together, we just could not see it until we did that. So it's really a really interesting observation. Um, Eric, you gave us lots of thoughts. It, there are lots of beneficiaries. Why, who wouldn't do it? Um, if you had to choose one, what's the ultimate? Who's the ultimate beneficiary? Uh... Ben, j'aime bien la proposition de Zainam, de, de toutes les gens qui I like the proposal of Zainam, of all those who are left aside. If we could uh, have a good picture of the participation uh, of, from people to the culture, we would have a better understanding of the case studies, of the success stories. We would be able to better understand the organization and uh, what they did to attract uh, sectors or audiences that were not in culture before. I like the idea of the, the, the journey. The, how can we bring non-public or, or people who do, are not interested in uh, going outside from home, how can we drive them to the cultural sector? Is it better beginning with comedy show maybe, or for some we have to offer for free? Because sometimes we know that we talk, that we have super uh, consumers, 20% of the population that consumes 80% uh, of culture. Often it's true around the world. So we have a huge collective work to do to interest more people in some sectors or disciplines. So if we better understand them, we'll be able to guide them and the whole cultural sector will be winning out of that. Uh, absolutely, I, I think that is a, and I think actually one of the benef one of the, the problems about having um, cultural organizations that were very, uh, they had a lot of data about their own organization and only about their own organization is that they can then get into an echo chamber. I think this idea that, you know, we think that data perhaps serves the, you know, the, the, the super consumer. In fact, this sharing of data does switch the, it, well, it can be used just to completely switch that dynamic. Peter, I'm going to give you the last word. Who really benefits? I think the uh, in the at the heart of the institutions that we're working with, there's their their mission, and they were founded to benefit the public. And I think what this work does is actually allow them to see whether they're actually doing that. And so taking it always back to the mission is something that really you know, and that thing that you were saying about visibility, data gives you visibility to say, are you delivering on your mission? And I think that's what I would leave it with. Are you delivering on your mission? There we go. Take that question with you through the rest of the conference. I hope you've enjoyed that. There are lots of sessions through the rest of the day now thinking about um, how we work together, how we coll collaborate, how we neutralise, how we work together for discoverability, my favourite new word of the conference. Um, and I just want to say, finally, um, thank you all so much for that. Uh, it was quick, but you were sharp and on it, and that was lots of really rich stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Um, do enjoy the rest of the, of the conference, everybody. Um, there are other sessions. You can still book some. I think... Coming up next, our consumer service at times of pandemic, and I know that's going to be an interesting one. I'm going to try and hop straight into that. Uh, there are other sessions you can still book and register for. Register for. So finally, panelists, thank you for rich conversation. Um, hopefully, connect connect up with them if you want to know more. You know where we all are on the platform. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.